Hello, everyone. I'm Terry Moran. Thanks for streaming with us. Senator Bob Dole, a decorated World War II veteran and presidential candidate who served in Congress for 36 years, is lying in state at the U.S. Capitol. Dole, who died in his sleep Sunday at the age of 98, will lie in state through tomorrow morning as the nation honors this statement, this statesman. President Biden delivered remarks this morning, calling Dole a giant of our history, a man of wit and grace, of principle and persistence, of courage and conviction. Funeral services for Bob Dole will be held tomorrow at Washington National Cathedral with President Biden set to deliver the eulogy. And we will bring that to you live. Day two of the manslaughter trial of former Minnesota police officer Kim Potter is underway. Prosecutors called Elena Albrecht Payton to the stand. She was a passenger in Dante Wright's car and she described the moments right after Dante Wright was shot. And he wasn't answering me, he was just a... Gasping. Like, just, 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 just take breaths of air. Former police officer Kim Potter shot and killed Dante Wright, who wasn't armed during a traffic stop earlier this year, and she resigned two days later. She says in that moment, she pulled her gun instead of her taser, claims it was a mistake. She is charged with first and second degree manslaughter. Starbucks workers who are attempting to unionize in Buffalo, New York, will have their ballots counted today in the first major test of the growing effort to organize the company's workers nationwide. If this vote is successful, Starbucks will be obligated to start the collective bargaining process with workers united and any of the stores that vote to unionize. And now to the fight against COVID-19. Dr. Anthony Fauci says he is encouraged by early studies that find boosters are effective against the highly contagious Omicron variant. This as we're learning that the FDA has just approved Pfizer booster shots for 16 and 17 year olds. But there are still concerns about a winter surge in COVID cases. Whit Johnson has the latest. Pfizer CEO saying in addition to a booster, a fourth vaccine dose might eventually be necessary to fight the Omicron variant. When we see real world data, we'll determine if the Omicron is well covered by the third dose and for how long. And uh, at a certain point, I think we will need the fourth dose. But many health experts insist it's still too early to know if that extra dose will be needed. Borla's comments coming on the heels of early data suggesting two shots plus the booster appear to stand up against Omicron. When you get that third shot boost, it dramatically increases the level of laboratory projected protection. This is good news about the booster protection. The Omicron variant now detected in at least 22 states. Our Dr. Jen Ashton getting rare exclusive access inside the CDC's Emergency Operations Center. This is like the impact of vaccination. Meeting with CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky, where scientists are tracking highly contagious variants like Omicron. When people hear more transmissible but looks less severe, how that is still a massive concern just based on sheer numbers. If we have a much more transmissible variant, you end up with a much larger population of people with disease and then even small amounts of that very large population that end up um, in hospital um, end up what you end up with a, a real crisis at the hospitalization level and, and potentially lots of poor outcomes. This as another winter surge fueled by the Delta variant begins to take hold. At least 31 states in D.C. seeing an increase in hospital admissions. The U.S. now reporting more than 117,000 cases each day, a jump of nearly 83 percent since late October. States like New Hampshire, Maine, and Wisconsin deploying the National Guard to ease the strain. Hospitalizations in Connecticut more than doubling in the last month. 100% of our patients who are admitted to the hospital at Greenwich Hospital, 100% are unvaccinated. 100% Right here. now, today. Every day, it's a little bit like going into battle, and we recognize that this is not over yet. And the CDC director confirmed to our Dr. Jen Ashton that they are considering whether to change the definition of fully vaccinated from two shots to three shots. For now, it will stay the way it is. But Dr. Anthony Fauci said in his opinion, it's going to be a matter of when, not if that change happens. Terry. All right, Whit Johnson, thanks very much for that. We want to talk a little bit more 
about one very serious issue surrounding the pandemic. The U.S. Surgeon General has issued a new advisory on a growing youth mental health crisis, warning that depression and anxiety symptoms in young people have doubled worldwide during the pandemic. ABC News medical contributor and emergency physician Dr. Darian Sutton joins us with the details. Good morning, Dr. Sutton. Good to see you on this important subject. Uh, tell us what's new in this report and why it's troubling. Oh, good morning, Terry. So there's some concerning signs that we're seeing in trends of adolescent health. Uh, what we know is that children, uh, adolescents, and young adults are facing some considerable challenges that seem to be exacerbated by the pandemic. And in this recent report, it actually looks at more than 80,000 youth globally, and it found some disturbing statistics, uh, some of which include symptoms of depression and anxiety have doubled more than twice during this pandemic, uh, with 25% of youth experiencing symptoms of depression and 20% experiencing symptoms of anxiety anxiety, and ER visits for suspected attempts of self-harm have increased by over 50% for young women. So it's an important topic to talk about, especially now. It, it is so difficult uh, to socialize in the pandemic, and that is the peak age of socialization. And if they're only on their phones socializing, that, that, that might be a problem as well. But this report also lays out disparities in access to resources for young people who need them. So what needs to change there? You know, that's actually the more concerning thing that I see in this report. These disparities are some of which reflect what we see in adult populations. They actually identify those that are vulnerable, which include but are not limited to uh, young children of color, uh, American, indigenous Americans, as well as Alaska natives, natives, and young people who identify as LGBTQIA+. The hope is that sharing information like this will, to, will not only help shed light on this topic, but to be honest with you, increase funding to mental health care services and hopefully provide access to these communities in need. Because it is such an important need and, and uh, we need to get those resources out there. Now, a couple of questions. First, have you seen in your own practice, I know you're an emergency physician, but evidence of what you'd say uh, is, is an increased problem with young people and depression or suicidal thoughts or attempts, and what should parents watch for if they're concerned? You know, well, there's a couple of discussions. Well, first off, to answer your first question, yes, I have seen a considerable increase in the amount of psychiatric emergencies in my anecdotal experience. And of course, we can see that this plays out in the data on a national and a global level. Uh, when I'm talking to parents, I try to help them to understand there are some warning signs uh, to things like depression that we should pay attention to. Uh, of course, they don't, this is not a, an inclusive list, but it's some of the important topics that can include things like excessive sleeping during the day or lack of sleeping at night, uh, frustration that is out of proportion to the cause, agitation, outbursts, or a change in daily behavior, or even something simple as the child is not interested in normal activities that they were previously interested in. I try to remind parents that these are some of the important signs that we should pay attention to. And the most important tip that I give to them is to trust your gut. We often know that something is wrong before it becomes obvious, so we should use that moment to open up conversation and to seek out help from a provider that we trust. That's a great, great point. We do understand each other at a level that we are often aren't, uh, don't, aren't articulating. So let's talk about solutions. How should these mental health challenges be handled? What, what can we do? You know, Terry, I think it really focuses on access, not just access in terms of education, but access to diagnostic testing, access to therapeutic intervention, and access to pharmaceutical interventions. What we have seen in these populations that are incredibly vulnerable that I just recently just discussed is that they just simply don't have the access. Um, but there is some cause for optimism because when we look at the research and over 50 years of research on natural disasters, we can see that young adults who are experiencing these distressing symptoms oftentimes are able to cope and go on without chronic long-term mental illness. So I'm hopeful that we'll see the same trajectory in this pandemic, um, but we have to uh, identify the problem first and intervene. And intervene and care for each other. Dr. Darian Sutton, thanks very much as always for that. Thank you. And we want to make sure if you or a loved one struggling with thoughts of suicide or deep depression, help is available. Call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at the number on the screen here. Go to suicidepreventionlifeline.org for free and confidential emotional support 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Help is out there. Well, coming up, the head of Instagram testified on Capitol Hill about the social media platform and children. So when we come back, the steps he says the app is taking to protect young users and what could mean for your kids.
And welcome back. The head of Instagram, Adam Mosseri, appeared before Congress for the first time on Wednesday, testifying about the app's effect, Instagram's effect on children. Mosseri defended the app, but just hours before the hearing, he introduced a new safety net saying the company will take more steps to protect children. Rachel Scott has the latest on this. The head of Instagram appearing before Congress for the first time, defending the popular social media app from blistering bipartisan criticism that Instagram is toxic for children, especially young girls. How do you square a business model that prioritizes user time and engagement with knowing there's a direct correlation between time and harm? Senator, respectfully, using our platform more will increase any effect, whether it's positive or negative. But if people don't feel good about the time that they spend on our platform, that's something I personally take seriously. Adam Oseri pointing to outside research showing more teens use TikTok and YouTube, introducing a new safety net hours before that hearing, telling lawmakers the company will take more steps to protect children, including prompts to suggest users take a break and other parental controls. But senators say the damage has already been done. Instagram is addicted. Senator, respectfully, I don't believe the research suggests that our products are addictive. Thanks to Rachel Scott on Capitol Hill for that. And joining us for more on this whole subject is the founder and CEO of Common Sense Media, Jim Steyer. Jim, thanks very much for being here. Uh, as we heard in Rachel's piece, uh, Adam Masseri was, Adam Masseri was grilled about Instagram's effect on children. What was your takeaway from the hearing? He should have been grilled is my number one takeaway. And second, as the as the uh, segment said, you know, they came up at the last minute with sort of a PR blitz about the changes they will make, which is pretty much reflective of the way that Facebook and Instagram have handled all this, which is deflect, deny, distract. And so I thought it was important because on a bipartisan basis, Congress, which has been largely missing in action for about a decade on these issues, really held Adam's feet to the fire. And the key now is for Congress to act and really regulate Instagram and the other platforms for the harms they do to kids and teens. Well, let, let, let's talk about the Instagram and the other platforms. There is a kind of cartoon version of that. Facebook is for fogies and Instagram for, for younger people. What yeah. are the concerns that you have about Instagram and mental health, social health for young people? So, Terry, it's clear, first of all, uh, you saw Senator Dick Blumenthal talk about the addictive qualities and the fact that the business model uh, is designed to maximize engagement and attention. So the fundamental business model of, of Instagram and Facebook and a couple of the other big social media platforms is to keep your kids there as long as possible. So addiction issues are very serious. But also, as you just heard from the prior segment, from when Dr. Vivek Murthy, the Surgeon General, came out yesterday with his important new report on teen depression and anxiety and suicide, he links it explicitly to overuse of social media platforms. And as the head of the biggest kids media and advocacy group in the country, we have a lot of research and we've had it for nearly a decade that shows some of the harms that kids who spend too much time on Instagram can have. They include body image issues, eating disorder issues, bullying, et cetera. And to be honest with you, Instagram has not dealt with any of these until yesterday's sort of Hail Mary announcement that they were gonna have new platforms. So, the time is ripe for Congress to do bipartisan legislation that really reigns in these platforms in terms of privacy, platform accountability, et cetera, Jerry. Hmm. And Masseri was on the, uh, on the grill, as, as we've been saying yesterday, and he right. kind of passed the buck a little bit. He said TikTok and YouTube, teens are using that more. Do you think that helps him out? Well, it, I, don't, I don't think it really helps him out. He's accurate in the sense that as someone who's a parent of four kids, Kids do not spend their time today on Nickelodeon and Disney Channel or PBS Kids the way they used to. They really are on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. And by the way, should TikTok and YouTube also be held responsible for the way their platforms perform? Absolutely. Um, but, but, but Facebook and Instagram are really the biggest problems. They have done almost nothing to address the very serious social emotional issues that have been raised for years about their platforms. So what you really need to do is have very serious legislation passed at the federal level 
on both kids and teens' privacy, but also on platform accountability that holds them liable for harms that occur on their platforms. And that would apply, obviously, to Instagram, but also to platforms like YouTube and TikTok. <clears throat> and the public wants this on a bipartisan basis. So I would tell you, stay tuned. We're going to see real action in the coming months, or we better see real action if you care about our kids and teens. And let me just quickly follow up. We just have a few seconds. What's the most important aspect of that legislation? What's the most important thing Congress could do? Two things. Number one, really strengthen the privacy laws and increase the Child Online Privacy Protection Act to, to children 16, under 16. So you'd extend it to teens. But the second thing also is to hold the platforms liable for the harm that happens to kids and adults on those platforms. That is the shield that they currently have. It's almost a get out of jail free card and Congress can remove that and should do so. And all of us will benefit in the long run if that happens. Such an important issue. Jim Steyer, thanks very much for helping us out with that. Great to see you, Terry. And we'll be right back. And welcome back. In recent days with the spread of the Omicron variant, many Americans have been reminded that this is a global fight. And if one part of the globe is struggling to contain the virus, it could have consequences for all of us. In our week-long series, One World, One Pandemic, ABC's Matt Gutman shows us the challenges in Africa that may impact us all. In the townships of South Africa's most populated province, rumors have been spreading almost as fast as Omicron. There's numerous uh, reasons why people don't want to vaccinate. Um, others are afraid, others is about the rumors. We continue with our breaking news story this afternoon. A new COVID-19 variant has been confirmed in the country. COVID's newest and possibly most contagious variant, Omicron, sweeping through Southern Africa's wealthiest nation. The total cases in South Africa rising 500% in just two weeks. And the timing could not be worse for the continent's 54 nations. We are also entering the festive season where there is a massive movement of population, people <laughs> gathering together. The virus erupting just as South Africa, a nation of 60 million, emerged battered from the Delta variant. We were going through a period of actually much lower level transmission of the virus. And we were getting optimistic that, that we might have a bit of respite again. Omicron now accounts for a vast majority of the cases in South Africa and has reached at least 10 other African nations, including the French territory of Réunion. And the epicenter of the epicenter is South Africa's Hauteng province, home of the megacity Johannesburg. Omicron is now dominant in Gauteng. Cases here are seven times higher than the nation's other provinces. I think I want to celebrate. I think people here have all lost hope when it comes to protection from COVID-19. I think many of them have developed the mindset that whatever happens, happens. They have lost hope and are not worried about this new variant as compared to the one before. Shockingly, the possibility of Omicron's rise was predicted. Back in September, Dr. Lessels and a team of doctors wrote a paper on COVID in Africa. The last sentence in his team's abstract warned, Africa must not be left behind in the global pandemic response. Otherwise, it could become a source for new variants. Is there a, you know, a top five, top three to-do list for the developed world in order to help uh, in, in what's coming in Africa? Vaccines, vaccines, vaccines. But fulfilling that top three is an uphill battle. Dr. Mfosha Bangu has been leading a push to get shots in arms in Mamalodi, about an hour outside of Johannesburg. All hands are on the deck. So what we are doing currently, we are trying also to make sure that we take vaccines to, to the people. We go in and have a pop-up site in an area so that people can come and vaccinate. But apathy looms large. Many residents here seem to be in no rush to get vaccinated. <laughs> vaccinated because I've been sick. I'm always occupied. I'm always occupied. I'm afraid of Corona also. I'm afraid of vaccination. I'm not against it though. I will vaccinate, but not, not any time soon. We are actually experiencing a, a lot of a vaccine hesitancy. I think it's not that people don't want to be vaccinated. People just need uh, more information on, 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 on the vaccines, especially on the issue of the safety. 
Just about one-fourth of South Africa's population has been fully vaccinated so far. It is now one of two nations on the continent that has obtained more doses than willing arms to put them in. We know countries, there are a few countries in Africa that have discarded some of the uh, doses. And uh, the, the simple reason is that uh, um, these countries received vaccines that are, are near expiring. Uh, with a very short shelf life. As it stands, only 7% of Africa's population has been vaccinated, according to Africa CDC. The World Health Organization's milestone to have 40% of the continent's population vaccinated by the end of the year now seems hopelessly out of reach. More shipments of vaccine are coming in, but logistical hurdles are hampering their deployment. In Kenya, where just 14% of the country is inoculated. 5 million shots arrived just within the past two weeks. That news sent people like Julius Tayuto hiking miles through the bush to a clinic, only to be sent home unvaccinated. Well, while we were still standing there, we were told the vaccine was over. So I was discharged and was not interested in following it up again. We've run out of uh, stock uh, five days ago. We, we, we have already, already ordered our supply again. In larger cities like Nairobi, misinformation and skepticism deterring some from rolling up their sleeves. Salon owner Godfrey Male says he's still not convinced. Two of my friends got vaccinated. After a few days, they caught virus. <laughs> you can be vaccinated and you can get virus again. So it's, it's nothing. And continent-wide, the shortfalls, not just in terms of access to doses, but also medical supplies. In October, UNICEF projected that Africa could be short 2.2 billion syringes in 2022, a crucial blow to administering shots. And that as a silent online killer stalks the continent. We've seen in um, uh, some countries really where um, um, the uh, influence uh, or misinformation that has been spreading through the uh, social media has had some devastating uh, um, uh, effects in terms of uh, um, acceptance of, of, of vaccination. Some of this misinformation being disseminated on social media is literally responsible for killing people? Yeah, I think uh, I think we can say that uh, with, with, without any doubt. Countries like Burundi vaccinating only 0.01% of the population. A combination of delays from the government and hesitancy. Still, back in South Africa, Dr. Shabongu says she is seeing glimmers of hope. With this uh, increased number of uh, cases uh, in, in our district, uh, in, in the entire province, now we are seeing that uh, there is actually an increased number of people who are coming in our vaccination sites. And as Omicron spreads, despite its travel restrictions, the emergence of a new variant is a reminder of how connected we are. What's the most important lesson that the rest of the world can learn from South Africa's experience so far? Just the very simple lesson that this is a global pandemic and it needs a global response, that we're all in this together and, and we need to act responsibly as a, as a global community. We're all in this together. Thanks to Matt Gutman for that. And be sure to tune into COVID-19, One World, One Pandemic, Friday at 8 Eastern, right here on ABC News Live. I'm Terry Moran. The news continues on ABC News Live with context and analysis. Have a great day. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.